In this video, we take a look at inherent risk. Now, this is an area that's uh, been beaten up by peer review. So it's a place that we need to be knowledgeable. We need to know how to assess inherent risk so that we can plan and perform our engagements in the right way. Watch this video, and I'm going to show you how to use the inherent risk factors to make a right assessment for inherent risk. Then I'm going to show you examples of the inherent risk assessments for particular assertions in particular account balances. And finally, we take a look at significant risk. So let's go to chapter 15, inherent risk. So why is inherent risk so important? Well, think about the risk of material misstatement equation, and you, are, you already know what this is. It's inherent risk times control risk equals the risk of material misstatement. If we assess control risk at high, which we often do for small to medium-sized engagements, then the inherent risk assessment equals the risk of material misstatement. Now, in the next video, I'm going to tell you how to assess control risk. So I won't go into that at this time, but let me just say again, if, if you assess control risk at high for most of your assertions, then your inherent risk is driving your risk of material misstatement. Your risk of material misstatement is then driving your planned audit procedures. So this inherent risk assessment is like critical in determining what you're going to do in your audit engagement. So let's take our first step and look at inherent risk factors. And you see several bullets here, but bullet number one is susceptibility to theft. So if you're auditing an entity and they have assets that are easily stolen, say inventory or cash, then those assertions for that area, those relevant assertions there, the inherent risk is going to go up. If you look at bullets two and three, we talk about complexity and subjectivity. So some of you audit banks, for example, and you've got an allowance for loan losses, and that estimate is complex and subjective. When you see those factors, this, these inherent risk factors of complexity and subjectivity, then your, your inherent risk is going to rise. If these are not in play, then the inherent risk will decrease. So what you're going to do in determining your inherent risk assessment is look at the relevant assertions for a particular account balance or transaction class and then simply ask, are these in play? If they are in play, if they're relevant, then ask yourself, is my inherent risk higher? Now, one thing in regard to inherent risk assessments you want to disregard the internal controls. So basically ignore internal controls as you determine what your, your inherent risk assessment level is. So if you've got, again, areas susceptible to theft, such as inventory or cash, that inherent risk is going up. If there's complexity or subjectivity, or you look at that last bullet, uncertainty, if those are in play at a high level, then your inherent risk is going to go up. Most auditors assess inherent risk and control risk and the risk of material misstatement at three levels, high, moderate, and low. Now, you can use a scale of 1 to 10, for example, if you wanted to, but most people use these three levels, high, moderate, or low. So as you look at an assertion in a particular account balance, such as receivables, 
And so you're looking at existence, for example, that assertion. Then you're asking yourself, is that complex? Is it subjective? Is, the, is it susceptible to theft? Is there uncertainty? And as you look at these factors, then you're going to determine the inherent risk assessment for existence in receivables. So that's the idea. That's the concept you're using as you make your inherent risk assessments. Here's some examples. You see on the first line, we have a high-tech uh, entity that, let's say, you're auditing. They have inventory that becomes obsolete uh, quickly because there's a lot of competition, a lot of innovation. Because of that, the inventory can become obsolete quickly. That has an impact on the valuation assertion for inventory. If that's your situation, then your inherent risk probably is high for the valuation assertion for inventory. In a second example, we see here a not-for-profit that has a lot of cash coming in. Well, cash can be easily stolen. Because of that, there's an impact on the inherent risk assessment for existence and occurrence. So you see how these inherent risk factors can impact the assertion and the level of the inherent risk assessment. You see some more examples here. If you want to hit pause and take a look, feel free to do so. If you've got my book, uh, Audit Risk Assessment Made Easy, you'll see the same uh, examples in chapter 15. You know, why is this really important? Well, if you assess your inherent risk too high, and let's say control risk is assessed at high, then your risk of material misstatement will be too high. And because of that, you're going to do too much work. So getting this inherent risk assessment is vital to determining what your risk of material misstatement is, especially if your control risk is assessed at high. Now, another problem you can have on the opposite side here is we assess inherent risk too low. If we do that, well, now the risk of material misstatement is lower than it should be, and then I might not perform enough procedures. And because of that, there might be a, a, a material misstatement that I don't detect. Then I'm issuing an audit opinion, an unmodified audit opinion, saying the numbers present fairly, but they don't. So again, the inherent risk assessment is vital to planning and performing the audit in the right manner. We said we'd also look at significant risk. Here's a slide about that. So in SAS 145, which is the new audit risk standard, uh, it says that a significant risk are those in the upper end of the spectrum of inherent risk. Now think about this in terms of a scale, a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being extremely risky. If you look at a particular assertion and you have an inherent risk assessment, say that is a 9 or a 10, well then it's a significant risk. In most audits, you'll have one or two or three significant risk. You, you normally don't have, say, 10 significant risk. You'll normally have like two or three. But you have to document what the significant risks are, and that determination is driven by this inherent risk assessment that we're talking about in this video. Uh, you see an example here in the middle of this slide, which is a construction contractor. Uh, they have 
the estimate of cost to complete contracts. That's complicated, it's subjective, and because it's complex and subjective, then your, your inherent risk here is going up. And usually it's going to be very high, a 9 or a 10, say, on a scale of, t- of 10, and that area would be a significant risk. i give you another example here at the bottom of this slide, and it's a nonprofit with lots of cash that's coming in. Because that money's easily stolen, then you probably have a significant risk. In summary, we've said that the inherent risk determination directly impacts the risk of material misstatement when that control risk is assessed at high. So getting this determination, the inherent risk determination right, is really important. We can determine that inherent risk uh, assessment by using the inherent risk factors such as susceptibility to fraud, complexity, subjectivity, and uncertainty. So if you use those factors and apply those to particular assertions in account balances, that's going to allow you to make a proper assessment of inherent risk. Next week, we take a look at the sister element, control risk. So when we get done with that video, you're going to have a good understanding of inherent risk and control risk, which make up your risk of material misstatement. So until we get back together, I hope you have a great week. Take care and bye now.